Dr. Eric Hazeltine is an author, futurist, and neuroscientist. He is former director of research at the National Security Agency, executive vice president at Walt Disney Imagineering, associate director and CTO for national intelligence at the Federal Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and a director of engineering at the Hughes Aircraft Company. Eric, in addition to your credentials at the NSA, I understand you were a psychologist. You know, we, we do our research here. I'd love to get your read on our national psyche right now, how it relates to voting and security, and I'm wondering if there's a connection and maybe why people might be resistant to online voting today. The way I would assess the national psyche right now when it comes to elections is lack of trust. Lack of trust that someone isn't going to try to mess with the election as they did in 2016. And we're hearing reports from the intelligence community and elsewhere that that's going on right now. A lack of trust that the voting system is secure from other issues. And then there's the issue of disease. Uh, if I go vote, am I going to pick up a virus? So I think people are very nervous about voting. And there's a lot of concern about trust. Can you trust the system? So from your background of directing research at the NSA, uh, I'm sure you've been privy to lots of conversations about hacking. Uh, we saw the misinformation campaign, in some cases, attempts to hack our voter registration list in 2016. Uh, in every tech category from finance to healthcare, we've managed to develop a system for managing that risk. Based on your background and what you've witnessed across critical, critical infrastructure like this, do you think there's a solution for voting? I do believe that electronic voting can be secure. There is no system, including our nuclear launch codes, that's 100% bulletproof. The key in modern security acknowledges is to operate under the assumption that you've been compromised so that you can detect it quickly, isolate it when it does happen, and fix it quickly. And that's really state of the art. And because of my knowledge about how these things are done, I've seen it done. It works very well. And I don't have any concerns at all that we can vote securely. In fact, and I would go so far as to say that electronic voting is probably more secure than the paper ballot or kind of voting we have right now electronically. Before we move on to anything else, uh, let's talk about Iowa. Um, you and I know that wasn't really a voting app that caused all this stir, but it really scared people, obviously. That wasn't so much a voting app issue as it was a reporting of the votes issue as to do we know what happened and will we ever know? Absolutely. It's the same thing that happens when you have any failure. It's a human element. At some point in the chain, a human didn't set it up right, didn't specify the right thing, didn't operate it correctly. So people tend to focus in the electronic realm on the technology, but having been what you'd think of as a bad guy or a burglar in this space, what we always focused on to exploit a target was the human element. And that's the piece that gets under recognized. So I can say with that fear of contradiction that the problem in Iowa and all the other problems that we've had at their root is a human vulnerability. Be a lot easier if it weren't for those pesky humans, I guess. And I, I always yeah. thought of the NSA as the good guys, I guess. Well, <laughs> we always like to think of ourselves that way. We aren't always painted that way in the press. Uh, you know, we're hackers for God and country, I guess you could put it that way. But uh, because we do that and we're the best in the world and we go up against the best in the world, we know what can be done and what can't be done, what can be guaranteed and what can't be guaranteed. And that's why I say that the state of the art right now is to say this system sooner or later probably will be compromised in some way. How do we set it up so that when that happens and if that happens, we're still going to be okay? You, you wrote an op-ed recently that said we should continue to do these tests and, and pilot things around voting. Uh, there's not as much time for pilots now, though, so should every piece of tech be considered? And, you know, my peers in Silicon Valley are coming together like crazy, and uh, there's, as you say, tech for everything. So do we just need to jump in head first here, given the situation? Yeah, if I were in charge, I would say let's find the best one or two, get the best white hat hackers we can, attack the heck out of it, really beat it up, find its holes, and get it working as fast as possible. And continue to do that. That's the thing about penetration testing and white hat exercises. They can't stop once they're done with the initial attack. They have to keep it up 24 seven actually. Do you think that ever gets politicized where someone that's just against um, online voting for whatever reason 
you know, you know, tries to create that lack of trust? Or do you think that that's just the default state that we're in and we've got to work through it? I absolutely think it'll get politicized. How can it not? After all, it's about politics. Um, and clearly, there are some who really are not going to benefit from electronic voting. Without mentioning any names, one party historically is underrepresented at the polls because people in that party have other life issues and they don't get to the polls for any number of reasons. If we lower the barrier to entry so that anybody could vote really easily, I think it's clear that one party is going to benefit over the other and you can just bet your bottom dollar that it's going to get fought tooth and nail. So what's the counter argument there? I mean, if, if you're in that other party, why, why do you think that this is a thing we shouldn't do? I think that if I were in that other party, and I actually am in that other party, I, the way I would look at it is to say, this is an opportunity, not a threat. And the key is, since it's inevitable, sooner or later it's going to happen, rather than fighting it, let's get out ahead of it and see how we can surf that wave rather than be drowned in that wave. No one would know better than you, Eric. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, you know what? Uh, it's a really important subject. I really appreciate being asked to weigh in. We're speaking to Amelia Powers Gardner, county clerk in Utah County. Amelia Powers Gardner is a county clerk of Utah County in Utah and was sworn into office in January 2019. Amelia is one of Government Technology 2020's top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers. Amelia, let, let's start by talking about the Utah County election system for managing voting before you got there. I, I think the headline that announced your arrival said something like Powers has a way forward to fix the dysfunction in the elections office. So how was it like when you found it? The elections office when I came in was really severely under-resourced and it was like all of their processes had been put together piecemeal. They had gone to vote by mail about a year and a half earlier. And in that process, they hadn't laid out a, a workflow. They had just kind of added a whole bunch of elements and shoved them together. They processed ballots in two buildings on three floors in six locations, moving ballots back and forth. At the polling locations, they were significantly under-resourced. That caused long lines and basically a lot of chaos. Also, there was really no way to communicate with voters. They had no social media accounts, no email lists, um, no active communication with the voters. So dysfunction is probably a pretty good way to describe how it was. One of the maverick sort of things that uh, I know Utah County uh, happens to be the first in the country to allow people with disabilities to vote remotely. Uh, tell me about uh, the original conversation there and how that played out. Yeah, we did a pilot for mobile voting and it was for our overseas and military members. After that pilot, we did an audit. The audit came back clean. We surveyed everyone who had used it. Those who surveyed loved it. We didn't have negative feedback from those that had actually used the system. It was all very positive. And as I looked at that, I wanted to look at other demographics that could be served, underserved populations that we could serve utilizing this. As we looked at the law, it said that anything used for overseas voters can also be used for the disabled community. It was really a no-brainer at that point. This is a demographic of people that are currently being underserved and that we could really use uh, some sort of a method to help serve them. It was a natural extension. So I'd like to hear about the results that you had. Uh, what were the reactions of the voters who heard this news and used these technologies? That's a great question. What's interesting about this is the most positive feedback we have received has been feedback from people who have actually used the system. Those people that were being underserved, they found that sometimes mailing in a ballot is not as simple as putting a stamp on it and putting it in the mailbox. And the alternate methods really put a barrier to them voting. Those that have used this system are our biggest advocates and they give us the most positive feedback. Because we're talking about innovation specific to COVID-19, uh, I also want to ask you about a voter who voted after a kidney transplant uh, and the oldest voter in America to have ever voted online. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, we have two different, two different people that we've served in, our, in the last several elections. One of them is a recent kidney transplant, couldn't leave their house, 
And frankly, their, their wife didn't want to leave the house either because she didn't want to be exposed to anything that she could bring home. And this person didn't have a reliable smartphone. We were able to bring them a tablet that they could then sanitize and they could cast their ballot using that. Because of the kidney transplant, they were in a long-term care facility and therefore they didn't get their mail. They didn't get their, their ballot in the mail. They were still able to cast a vote utilizing this electronic system independently. And for them, security is more than just a technological thing. It's also a germ thing. And they were able to do that. The other person, the 106-year-old, in fact, she'll be 107 this year, Maxine Gramet. She broke her ankle about two years ago and is bedridden. Her caretaker is her daughter, who at 106, Maxine's daughter is in her 80s. And Maxine can't really hold a pencil very steadily, but she's very mentally astute, very spry, just can't walk and has a hard time with arthritis holding a pencil. Paper ballot was difficult for her. We were able to give her an iPad. The print is plenty large enough. She was able to read that ballot, cast her vote, independently with dignity and the greatest thing about about Maxine is she is really passionate about being able to vote in every election. Maxine was born before women in the United States had a right to vote. So being able to cast her ballot every election is incredibly important to her and we were able to facilitate that using technology. Wow, those are those are terrific stories. Um and you know with an aging population and and you know, more people falling sick, uh, lots of people in hospital beds, you know, unable to access those mail-in ballots. Um, wh what specific innovations are out there that would be helpful to get them to vote? There's, there's several things that we need to do. There's some that we have, like mobile voting is becoming more accessible. That's absolutely something that we need to consider. If someone's in a hospital bed, they're not at home getting their mail. So we can't mail them a ballot. Also, it might be hard to verify their identity. But if they have a smartphone that has a thumbprint on it, then their phone can verify their identity for us. We can ensure they're getting the right ballot and that they're getting it in a timely manner. We also can do so more, um, more securely germ-wise, right? a piece of paper can have a virus that it could carry on. I think we're hearing that the COVID-19 virus can last possibly days on a piece of paper. But if you have your phone, you can wipe that down with a Clorox wipe. And it's only exposed to you. You're not handing it to a nurse who's putting it in an envelope, who's giving it to a mailman, who's giving it to our, our election workers. It's more sanitary. It's more accessible. If someone is sitting in a hospital bed all day, chances are they're on Instagram. And if they're on Instagram, they can vote. I'm already wiping my phone down three times a day anyway, so this will, this right. will work great for me. Um, so I read the news like everybody else, and, and I'm curious your perspective on this. You know, what's missing in the national discourse when we're talking about finding solutions for safe and secure elections uh, in November or even in the future? What, what frustrates you when you read the news? Right now, one of the most frustrating things for me is we have a political party that's pushing for vote by mail nationwide. I'm not opposed to vote by mail. I am a vote by mail county. I have about 300,000 registered voters in my county and we mail every single one of them a ballot, every, every election. I think vote by mail is great. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we had to put in our order for our envelopes for vote by mail in October. We had to solidify our schedule with the print vendors in December. We had to finalize those schedules in January. We're four months past that right now, and in some cases, in envelopes, six months past that. You can't just go down to your local print vendor on the corner and say, can you run a safe and secure election for me? In my county, I couldn't go down to even Kinko's and say, I have 300,000 people, and they belong to 300 different precincts, and each one of those precincts receives a different ballot, and it needs to be safe, and it needs to be secure, and it has to be timely. Can you make that happen? We simply don't have the bandwidth. You need to have print vendors that have experience and expertise in this. Those print vendors, this is not their small year. This isn't a small municipal election. This is their biggest year, a presidential year. In an, in an off year, a municipal year, they're working one shift um, and, and they've got 
some, maybe some direct mail campaigns to kind of keep their presses running. And they could probably push that off and ramp up their production. This year, in a presidential year, they're working three shifts. They have all of their assembly lines working and they've been scheduled for a year. We can't just turn a key and say, can every one of you triple your production? Because they don't have capacity. They don't have buildings. They don't have machines. And the machines they use are custom order, most of them made in Germany, and they're a year or two out. We can't turn a key and make vote by mail happen nationwide like that. What we can do is utilize a smartphone. The vast majority of Americans have a phone that they could use to securely vote. And then those that don't, we could probably pick up the slack with vote by mail. But a lot of people aren't looking at the logistics. It's not as simple as a piece of paper in an envelope when you're talking about a safe, secure election. That is one of the magical things about, you know, online is it's, it's bits and bytes and, you know, it can be immediately distributed yeah. and immediately used. Technology is scalable in a way that paper and pencil just isn't. So before you go, Amelia, um, talk to me about some of the gaps in the voting system that have been exposed by the coronavirus. What, what should tech startups be thinking about? I, I'm an investor. Where should I be making more investments to help? How do you best see the public and, and private sector sort of working together here? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I see two areas. One of them is polling locations. There's a lot of issues with polling locations. It used to be that we did polling in elementary schools all over the country. In today's society, we can't have a thousand random people walking into an elementary school on a school day. That's just not something we can have. On top of that, I talked about it a little earlier, the vast majority of poll workers across the nation are retired, which means that they're in that age demographic. Even if the polling locations are open and people are willing to show up at the polls, in Clark County in Illinois, they had polling locations where no poll workers showed up because they didn't want to be exposed to the virus. Polling locations create a lot of logistical issues. And the second major issue is our voter database. That, that's everything from the security of our database. Imagine vote by mail. If somebody messed with the addresses on my 300,000 voters, that could cause some serious problems. I would love to see our voter database put in the blockchain because then if somebody changed those addresses, if they messed with that information, we would have a record of that change. So that's part of the identity issue. The other part is verifying your identity. In a lot of cases right now, you have to show up in person and pull out your ID, that's you know, the government issued ID. If we could electronically verify someone's identity, then we can allow them to cast a ballot we can allow them to register to vote without having to physically be there in person and then managing that database. As an investor who's invested in, you know, a couple thousand tech startups, um, one of the things that I've learned is that sometimes, you know, buzzwords and new technologies are the things that scare people. So blockchain, you know, people, what, what some people hear is unproven, you mm -hmm. know, does that really work? Is that really secure? Do you think that plays a role in the psyche that, that maybe we ought to at first depend on much more long-term established technologies than necessarily trying to use the latest, greatest thing? Well, I think if those technologies have the ability to give us an immutable record, then yes. I lean to blockchain because it gives us an immutable record. If something has changed, we know it. If we can do that with an existing technology, I'm not opposed to it. But currently, we have our voter databases they, they have all the protections of a server you can think of. Uh, we have secured transfer services to our print vendor. But we send that, let's say we, it's secure on our end and we send it to a print vendor. If someone hacks into that print vendor system and messes with those addresses just prior to them printing labels and, and sending out our vote by mail, once again, that could wreak havoc. I would love for them to have the ability to check that record against an immutable record. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is the vast majority of the people, they utilize their cell phone to do their banking. They fill out the census. They send money. They purchase items. They put their most private information on their phone. The vast majority of people are excited about mobile voting, and they want it. They just don't happen to be the loudest in the crowd. That's awesome. Yeah, I totally agree with that. 
Stephen Trout has a big job. He is responsible for ensuring the uniform interpretation and application of Oregon's election laws. He oversees voter registration, state initiatives, referendums, candidate processes, campaign finance reporting, and the production and distribution of the state's voters pamphlet, which is distributed to approximately 1.7 million households for each primary and general election. I read a poll earlier this year, clearly not talking about you, uh, Oregon, but it said 43% of the public don't think election administrators are doing anything to secure our elections. Uh, This seems like a significant challenge you face in doing your job. What, What do you do to assuage these sorts of concerns? You know, I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, I'm not a I'm not a media communications person. Uh, I'm just trying to administer the elections, and uh, I think we need to do a better job of of communicating the things that we're doing. Uh, you know, compared to four years ago, we are light years ahead of where we were there. I mean, I have conversations um, at least once a week, if not two or three times a week, with the Department of Homeland Security, um, with the FBI. Earlier this year, um, back in January, I think in a two-week period, I had four briefing calls and three classified briefing calls with all of them just talking about different threats and all of that. Some of that discussion has been lost with, uh, with COVID, but uh, the threats are, are still real. But I think to the question, the, the challenge is getting people to understand what we do. And I'm not, I'm not having any success at getting free media because it's not Uh, sensational or sexy information to say all of the firewalls and the protocols that were put in place to protect an election, uh, to protect our technology. And so I think that's the biggest piece of the challenge. What can the private sector do to help? What are the gaps that you think need to be filled? Well, I think, you know, again, focusing on where the voters are, what, uh, what they want. I think there was a Harvard Harris poll last week that said uh, 57% of people um, were happy to vote on the internet. Um, you know, if you listen to the narrative out there with different policymakers and some of the advocacy groups, you know, they're saying we should never move there. And so I think um, kind of like vote by mail, it's not something that you want to flip the switch and, and move to overnight, but I think we want to try to meet the voters where they are and start to uh, look into different tools that we could allow them. And, you know, there's a lot of security, a lot of technology out there. Uh, yeah, there's challenges, I'm sure, but if we don't start working on it and start doing pilots and start testing things and, and having, um, you know, cooperation with a lot of smart technical minds, we're not going to get there. Um, but I think we can get there. The public wants us to get there. And um, what we don't want to do is have a crisis like we've got this year with, with, uh, with the pandemic driving policy changes and, and people jumping to, to vote by mail when they haven't really thought about it or, or implemented a lot of policies. As far as your question with respect to what can the technology industry do, I think a lot of it is having something that's easy for the public to understand because the public's got to have confidence that this system, whatever it is, is secure and safe and that their vote is going to be accurately um, counted. I think you've mentioned in the past that misinformation is still the biggest concern here in 2020. So what what kinds of narratives are you actually most concerned about when it comes to voting itself? The scary part, uh, you know, as we continue to move forward is more and more people using um, election administration for partisan political gain um, and kind of sensationalizing things. And that's happening on both sides of the aisle. And, um, you know, we need to try to avoid that. Uh, all that's doing is, is reducing public confidence. There's a divide, it seems like, between voters, policymakers, senators, you know, who, who believe that the technology that is internet connected, like voter registration, application, you know, issuing mail-in ballots, is, is fine. But somehow, once that technology is, is on a mobile phone, it's suddenly risky and dangerous. What, what am I missing in, in this argument? I don't think you are missing anything. I think they're the ones that are missing the, the argument. And, and uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of that's driven by partisan politi- political uh, thoughts. Um, but yeah, I mean, we need to evaluate all of our systems and, and uh, you know, make sure that they're secure, make sure that they're accessible. But I think this absolutism out there um, is really driving, um, driving a wedge. And, you know, we've, you know, our systems need to be secure. Yes. Um, we need to be able to accept some risk that we can mitigate to allow military and overseas voters to return their ballots, those with accessibility needs to be able to return their ballots. There's got to be a balance here because, again, um, 
I, I've never seen a perfect election. I don't expect to see a perfect election in my lifetime. Um, we're, um, you know, we're doing this the best that we can and, and it's very, very good. It's better than it's ever been, but is it perfect? No. Um, and so just because something, um, might, um, have a problem, um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try it. And, and if let's find out if there are problems and let's test things and, and use the technology partners to, uh, to make things better at the same time. You know, some of these voices are loud. Some of them are um, small groups that just have a good uh, megaphone. Um, other groups uh, aren't able to get their voices heard as much. And so there's, there's always a balance out there, especially, I think, when we talk about security and accessibility and our military and overseas voters. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we're going to have to accept some risk there. But at the same time, with accepting that risk, we need to have things in place to be able to detect if something goes wrong and then to be able to correct it. Those are the, the challenges as we look to the future is, you know, we can't sit here where we are today and expect, you know, even vote by mail to be the, the tool that we're going to be using 20 years from now. We've got to continue to develop and, and innovate and look at new ways to do things. We need to look at better ways to authenticate voters. I think that's the big thing coming in the next 10 years. Um, we can't stay where we are today. We need to continue to uh, to to get better and and, and innovate and uh, be able to better serve our voters where they where they want to be served. Shannon O'Brien was the first woman state treasurer of the state of Massachusetts and formerly Democratic nominee for governor. You were elected to office for the first time in 1986. Thirty years later, what has changed in how we vote? Well, back in 1986, it was incredibly labor intensive. Everything was done on paper. Uh, you know, getting phone numbers so that you could reach out to voters was a, an incredibly labor intensive process. Uh, getting absentee ballots, again, took time and had a lot of rules and regulations about how you actually got those absentee ballots uh, into the, the, the town clerk's office. And so back then, it took a lot of human beings to make this happen. Uh, so a lot has changed over the years, but now, uh, as we're seeing that as technology and, and, and different uh, issues are, are coming to the forefront, uh, we have a lot of people thinking that it's an important time to go back to those days where it's just all paper. I think it's sort of fascinating that you see a lot of people now calling for harking back to paper ballots, uh, and I sort of shudder when I think uh, about what that was like back in 1986. In 2000, we were introduced to hanging chads. Uh, today, we're back to talking about paper ballots. Kevin Roos from the New York Times says that he's decided that Americans should vote by etching our preferred candidate's name into a stone tablet with a hammer and chisel. I think he's kidding. What do you think about the evolution and thought and the perception? Why is it that people feel this way? Well, obviously, everyone is concerned about the possibility for uh, compromise or hacking. I mean, I, you know, was working on the campaign back with the hanging chads, and we had something similar in the congressional district um, where I live, something similar uh, in terms of how the paper ballots and the punch system uh, did not work during a, a very uh, heavily uh, attended uh, a congressional race. Um, so, but we have seen over the course of the last, you know, number of years, uh, we've seen the Equifax hack. We saw in 2016 uh, that the Russians had attempted to, at least in 21 states, attempt to hack the voting machines uh, in, in different jurisdictions there. So I think that there's a heightened concern about technology, whether or not it can be fully secure, and especially whether or not it can be fully secure for such an important right um, as uh, placing your vote and, and uh, expressing your opinion as to who should be leading the, the state or the country. Most people, like like myself these days, we do online banking. I just did my census online. Uh, as an investor, I transfer a lot of money around online. But but today we're hearing people say that mail-in ballots are really the only option. Um, it seems crazy to me, but what do you think? Are there barriers uh, to mail-in ballots that people generally miss? Uh, are states willing to bear the cost uh, when we need money in other places? Are we justified in investing our resources here? Paper ballots are not hackable but they are not infallible. We've seen, I think in this country, in the last election, the last presidential election, uh, over 400,000 absentee ballots 
either didn't make it to get counted, were rejected because the signature on the ballot did not m match a, a signature, you know, within the clerk's office. So paper ballots, while the putting pen or pencil to paper and getting that done is not hackable, the process between getting that vote from your home or uh, your office or wherever you're going to be actually filling out the, the ballot and getting it in and actually having it counted there are many of potential pitfalls uh, that can happen. And, and we saw this just this past week uh, in Wisconsin, where you know there, there were so many people who needed to send in uh, absentee ballots because workers concerned about the coronavirus did not want to show up and man the polls. And so I think they had something like one-tenth the number of in-person uh, balloting uh, locations, so people had to wait hours and hours. Uh, those ballots that, that uh, you know, did not get in on time, they will not be counted. But those people in Wisconsin, or those 400,000 people whose absentee ballots didn't count in the last cycle, their vote doesn't get diluted their vote gets stolen. And so for me, accessibility, if I have to determine between security and voter fraud and, and accessibility, I'm going to tip the scales in terms of accessibility, but I still think there is a way that you can do both. I believe that there is a way that you can balance many of the concerns that different people have right now um, and, and do it in a way that's reasonable, that protects both the ability to access and, and have an opportunity to vote, but also promotes uh, security and, and reduces voter fraud. I'm certain that with coronavirus changing how we do business, you know, some government services, maybe licenses and IDs, We'll move online, but what are the practical barriers to elections moving online? The real issue is, is I think right now going to be cost. Um, you know, we saw that in the the the, the stimulus package, approximately four hundred million was was put into that bill to help uh, make sure that people can get to the polls uh, in during this coronavirus crisis. So it's going to cost money. But it's also going to require a, a, a meeting of the minds between the left and the right, the Republicans and the Democrats, that they agree that making sure that voter access, especially during this just unusual pandemic crisis we're having right now, uh, is important. And I think that the most important thing toward making voting more accessible is to understand that making voting more accessible is an important civil and constitutional right that we all have. Sounds reasonable to me. Um, you've sort of answered this one. I'm going I'm to ask it again in case you have anything else to add. Um, what are the political challenges associated with modernizing the voting process? The political challenges are that right now you don't have everyone in agreement about what the best process is for both securing the vote and making voting accessible. And I think that the most important thing that can happen is to take some very measured and rational steps towards testing some new technologies. But the fact is, you had people who weren't trained, you had new rules that were brought to bear during those Iowa caucuses. So there were many things beyond the technology that made the Iowa caucuses a failure. And so understanding that any new technology, even going to uh, 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 mail-in ballots, there will be issues and problems that have to be dealt with. And so it's making sure that we understand that whatever we do, this is not going to be a quick fix and has to be part of a longer process moving us forward where we can both use technology and maybe old fashioned technology uh, to increase both accessibility and security, but do it in a rational, well thought out uh, and hopefully bipartisan way. What needs to be done to make the changes necessary to improve access? What, if, what would you do uh, if you could wave your magic wand? I am a believer in taking a look at uh, mobile voting platforms, uh, looking at ways that we can enhance uh, both the accessibility but also uh, the auditability, because there are many voting machines out there that count the paper ballots that we cannot subject them to simple uh, audits. So making sure that we understand that we can use technology to make these improvements. And so I think it's just you know, understanding that we're going to be able to use technology, that we need to do it in a number of different facets that, that can help us as a, as, a, as a state, as a nation. Uh, and so moving in that direction, I think, is going to be uh, very, very important for, for all of us as citizens. Shannon, I hear you have a personal story about 
uh, voting that maybe is relevant to all of this? In 1976, my dad ran for the United States Congress uh, in the post-Watergate uh, era. And it was a year that many people thought a de that a Democrat might win the seat. And my father ran against a very well-qualified uh, candidate, uh, Ed McColgan. And the primary, uh, he won by something like 12 votes. And then during the recount process, there were votes that went back and forth, and he ended up losing by four votes. I think it was the closest congressional vote in the history of the state. I think it still remains. But the real issue was, and this is the problem with, with um, paper ballots, is that you can't change paper ballots because they need to be printed. They need to be sent out. And so the problem that my father faced is that he actually thought he might be able to go to court and successfully challenge the outcome of that, that recount. But he couldn't go to court because even if he won the court case, there would not have been enough time to print his name on the ballot. So he gracefully, you know, uh, uh, st st stepped back. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people thought that my dad actually won that primary. So it was one of those things that you understand the inflexibility of, of a paper ballot. Someone goes and they vote for Pete Buttigieg, he drops out, or Bernie Sanders, he drops out. They're not on the ballot anymore. And if you've already voted, you don't get an opportunity to quickly or easily change your vote. Nimit Sani is co-founder and CEO of Votes. Nimit's background is in mobile security and development, previously serving as director of research and development at Oberther Technologies, and prior to that, as director of research and development at More Magic Solutions. Nimit, you guys have been on the front lines of mobile voting and have taken a lot of heat for it. Can you talk about what kind of resistance that you run into? Sure. The Concerns we hear are primarily around um, regulation, legal aspects, and obviously security. There is a long-held uh, perception that nothing on the internet can ever be safe. And so that is particularly highlighted when it comes to voting. Well, that scares me because I do a lot of online banking and wire transfers <laughs> online. So it's, it sounds like an emotional response rather than a factual one. Why, why do you think that is? There are some <clears throat> reasons behind it. Traditionally, attempts to vote online have been um, disrupted and, and compromised due to certain structural weaknesses. However, what has happened in the last few years is there have been uh, certain technologies which have come up in other industries which now actually, in our uh, humble opinion, make it possible to make this safe enough. So that's why we've been at the forefront of pushing this hard. So I, to me, it's a inevitable future. We, we will get there, but I, I get you know, that there's resistance to it. But, but let's talk about the advantages of electronic voting. What, what do we actually stand to gain by improving the system? I think the biggest advantage is um, wider participation. And in, in some cases, improve security as well. And also in the current situation where we find ourselves in a very unfortunate uh, situation with the, the COVID-19 virus, it's actually uh, a lot safer from a health perspective to vote from your home rather than go have to stand in a line for hours like what happened in Wisconsin yesterday. What are the actual challenges though? What, what should we be worried about? <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge when it comes to remote voting is being able to uh, satisfy a few different criteria. The first one is, can you trust to a reasonable extent the device from which the voter is voting on? Second one is, can you, to a high degree of accuracy, prove the identity of the voter? Because when you're in person, you can see the person, you can mark them off a list, you can, you know, in a scenario, also ask them for an ID. But in a remote scenario, just using a, a password and a you know, username is not sufficient when it comes to voting. And then the third challenge is how do you secure the data once it's been transmitted by the voter and then keep it in an auditable uh, way so that it can sync with the existing system and also provide the advantages which some of these new technologies provide. So I would say those, those are the big challenges which uh, 
which have prevented um, any form of voting online from going uh, mainstream in the past. And the folks who have solved that problem, uh, the biggest one has been in Estonia, have been very successful at it, but the rest of the world has, has been lagging. You know, to me, there's a huge difference between a complete move to mobile voting and incremental progress, like focusing on people with disabilities and absentee ballots, for example. But it seems to me there's equal resistance. Why is that? Yeah, that's one of the things which has been really surprising to us as well. Um, and I think, once again, it comes from a sense of um, um, sort of emotional reaction. We've, <clears throat> as you rightly said, it's very important to try this using what we call as baby steps. So start really small. Start with uh, the voting demographics, which are the most disadvantaged. So in, in the case of the US, it's the citizens living overseas, deployed military personnel, and also members of the disability community. And these are almost, if you add them all up, 20 plus million people who are not able to vote like the rest of us. And so I think starting there made a lot of sense to us. And that's where we focused our early 10 pilot programs on. So how can you make it easier for this demographic to vote? And if it's successful here, it's validated here, then you can take the next baby step to expand it to you know, the next demographic, maybe college students who are away from their homes, <clears throat> elderly who are in a hospital, and then maybe everybody else. So definitely... Uh, that's the way to go. The situation we find ourselves in right now with uh, the COVID situation may require us to accelerate some of that, but definitely traditionally slow is, is the better way to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that acceleration. I mean, this has really become a top issue uh, on the list of priorities for the country now uh, with elections coming up. Uh, how do you actually see this playing out given what's going on with the health crisis? I think it's it's a it's a scary thought to think like what's happening right now might come up continue up until November, but it's it's a it's a very realistic possibility, um, and so we definitely need to prepare for that. And <clears throat> because of the way our election infrastructure has been built, and sort of the resistance to innovation over the last many decades, we actually now find ourselves in a situation where our system is not resilient to a kind of a natural disaster event like this where because of our over-reliance on in-person voting now we are so sort of struggling to find options and the sort of the next best option being proposed is, is mail-in voting which has worked in uh, in some of the states who who've been doing it for a while it's hard to jump into mass mobile voting overnight because there's a lot of preparation required. You require personnel, equipment. And so it's not, I don't think there's a single solution. I think we have to consider everything we can offer here to the voters to ensure that the turnout doesn't dip. And so mail should be on the table. Remote options using the internet should be on the table. And anything else we can come up with should also be on the table. So definitely, I think it's the time to expand, not to reduce options. I think because of a lot of the in-person voting locations, in-person voting options have gotten disrupted. Um, most of the inbound we are getting is, is about how can we move this event primarily online or you know, 100% online or maybe like a hybrid uh, online situation. And so, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and panic and fear for, for good reason. And so what we are trying to encourage is to offer options where the, the entire election could be conducted online, or we've also rolled out some additional options for scenarios where people can vote on a phone call or can have a restricted set of uh, vote center locations where you know iPads are available and you can as long as you know more than 10 people don't congregate at the same time, uh, you can walk up touch screen on an iPad and, and vote as well. Why create votes? What, what's driving you, motivating you? What's the background story for the reason that you're spending your energy on this? We started votes almost by accident. 
um, my brother and I, we were at a hackathon at, at South by Southwest in 2014, where we ended up um, prototyping a, a new election system uh, and actually won the hackathon. And what really uh, intrigued us during that process was certain childhood experiences which came to bore. We had seen uh, people being forced to vote at gunpoint. And so when we uh, looked at the, the properties behind the technology being used by Bitcoin and some of the security options which were available there, kind of made sense to have a system where we could avoid the in-person coercion scenarios. And so that was one of the main uh, motivations um, to have an accidental participation and combination of some um, unfortunate uh, childhood experiences growing up. Super interesting. Thanks so much for the time. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.